ok, ok, ok. So, I start? Ok. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, chol. I have the... On, I, I'm Alejandra Fernández from Universidad Nacional del Nordeste, National University of Northwest in Argentina. I have the honor to present this panel of workshop Dialogical Space and the Challenges of Technology. For his purpose, we are accompanied by Specialist Ebrahim, Dr. Philip, Dr. Yela, 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 sorry, uh, Dr. De La Fuente Lora, who will present their positions. This panel uh, will deal with relationship between two things, recognition, reconciliations, forgiveness and judgment in the space or dramatical challenges by the technological and a scientific advancement which the consequence of planetarization and uh, technology. Um, so, in, in first uh, time, doctor, no, specialist, sorry, Nazarene Ibrahim, Nasser Ibrahim is founder and CEO NAS Consulting International. He's a communication and technology specialist, consultant to diverse industries over uh, last 15 years yes, on online and corporate communication and marketing in the Southern Africa region. Uh, her clients have been predominantly within the technology, education, agriculture, and uh, retail space. As a representative on the board of the Minara Chamber of Commerce, Nazarene is active in the South African business community, mentoring young entrepreneurs and driving technology education programs. Your team is Kindness of AI. Okay, uh, are we good Jen? to go? I'm sorry. Uh, um, 15 minutes each one. Thank you. Sorry, I'm sorry, Nasser. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The kindness of AI. And first, I want to say thank you to my you friends who have uh, stayed the very long journey. You've come from the session this morning, so I see them, Heva, Kelly, Reem, now, John, Claire. Thank you so much for being in the audience and to everyone who's attending today. So the last three days have been incredibly interesting, well, the last two days. And I suppose we're kicking off today to try and wrap up what I think you will hear are common themes that are emerging uh, especially because yesterday the focus was a lot on space exploration and what it means for us as a species. Why are we talking about the kindness of AI? Well, no act of kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. So you'd remember this from the fable of the lion and, and the mouse. Now, kindness. What, what do we think about this? What does kindness mean to you? I'm going to ask my panelists very quickly, but I also encourage you and urge you to take a moment to think about kindness, because I have run this experiment online by asking people across Facebook and LinkedIn what it means to them. It might not be a very fair analysis or a survey, um, depending on what their profiles are, but I didn't get many answers, maybe because people are still thinking about it. So, gentlemen, Chris, what does kindness mean to you? One word. <laughs> Something. It just means listening. 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 Kindness. Swain. Yes. What does kindness mean to you? What? I didn't uh, hear. Kindness. What does it mean to you? One word. Kindness. Yes. This is a live uh, experiment in terms of getting a sense of what kindness means to people. So listening. What does it mean to you? One word. Feeling. Feeling. Gerardo. Sense. Sense. 
And the lovely lady, Alejandra. Future. Future. <laughs> kindness. So what does kindness mean to you? Now, in understanding this, there's two words here, right? Okay. Kindness and AI. And language is such an important thing. It's such a particular thing. I think in the last couple of sessions across the days, we understand what language means in terms of um, communicating, understanding, picking up references, inferences. So kindness. Why would we talk about these things in a connected manner? They are also referred to sometimes as the ethics or the virtue or the compassion of kindness. When you think about technology, these terms are mentioned but at the fringes of what the bills might look like. From my perspective as a media and communications specialist, I managed to intersect into this particular area uh, uh, around understanding human connection and the social contracts that we build as human beings. Kindness is a fundamental way of establishing goodness between one another. Mm. It's uh, not rooted particularly in religious indoctrination, but it is a universal concept. And that's what we come to know. You know, when, you, when you're born um, as human beings, why are we known particularly as the most intelligent species? Because we have an ability to reason, to understand and connect with one another, to give one another a sense of dignity. That's, I think, at the base level of what you want to understand by kindness. So having that rationale, when you're born, you uh, learn the basics, the motor neuron skills of walking <laughs> and looking at your parent or whoever it might be, and you learn these, these skills. But as you start to understand and your relation to people, then things that you think about and the brain's ability to connect you to other people, whether it's through manipulation or wanting to have the best interests for them, you are still understanding these things. So in that regard, kindness by its very nature is a fundamentally deeply personal ability for you to care. That's why I asked the question, what does kindness mean? Because currently in current day, the sense of care is a very different concept for people. And we can see that in the way that the geopolitical scene is unfolding across the world. We can see that in the way that corporations are understanding their ESG, you know, equity, sustainability, um, I can't remember, governance. I was going to say growth, but it's governance. Mm. And so these concepts are intertwined, and we may have little time, but the objective today is to make you think. My role as a media and comms specialist, but also as an AI ethics practitioner, is to establish the conversation around kindness. Because I do believe that it's not very well interrogated. I think we might be afraid by our potential to care at some point. Why? The level of trust in the world at the moment across the board, whether it's corporations and particularly technology businesses, is not high. That translates also into our trust with one another to trust that we are not, and I will take my cue from yesterday's sessions, that we are not aliens to one another. If we come from different cultures, that's how you feel when you meet somebody else. You know, uh, we have to just look at the refugee crisis across the world to understand that concept. So kindness, please, I always urge you, understand your level of kindness. Now, I also speak about kindness from uh, the perspective of being a Muslim woman. You know. Um, uh, the icon that I uh, hold to, to um, a level of what I do in my life, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, and he said, every act of kindness is charity. Before I move on to the AI component of this subject, charity is not merely to enable someone in a practical sense to let them, get them to live. You know, you, I have food, I don't have food, suddenly I have food. I don't have shelter, you give me something, I have shelter. Charity is also about enabling and constantly reinforcing the dignity of other people. Mm. And I think that is our purpose, actually. The purpose of living is to enable the dignity of others. In the African culture, I am an African woman as well, from the African continent, and I'm pleased that we have another African representative. <laughs> Ubuntu is a concept in the African philosophy about I am because you are. Mm -hmm. And I suppose... From a religious perspective, no matter where we come from, the idea of I am, therefore you are, is centrally or universally rooted. It is part of that. So understanding the humanness of why we exist 
to enable the dignity of others is key to understanding that. Now, why does this matter in the world of AI? Because if you look at the way machines are trained, and you know, you've got large language models, you have uh, robots that need some kind of training or data, just to put it at a very simple level, the training that you're looking at, when you think about language specifically, so think about language. I'm speaking English. There are multiple tongues here on stage, in the audience. Uh, whether our languages are gendered or not, that's also another dynamic around it. So we communicate with one another. Language in its spoken format and written format provides a certain sentiment of what you want to do. Now, added to that sentiment is also expression. So when we talk to one another, that's why I hate WhatsApp. My God, sometimes when you send a WhatsApp message and then you get that blue tick syndrome, you don't know if the other person's upset with you or what's happening. So <laughs> you got to get it together, right? And then I'm like, let me pick up the phone. Excuse me. You know, this is not what I meant. I'm actually... So, sentiment is an incredibly interesting concept. You know, the facial recognition that you have, facial recognition systems, are trying to capture what? Yes, of course, it's the basic things, gender, color, all kind of parameters associated with an outcome. But expression paired with speaking the language, what are you trying to convey? That whole delivery in a matter of seconds is able to have an outcome. Now, when machines are trained to do that, can they enable, and I think, John, you spoke about this very well yesterday when you brought up the concept of wisdom, and that really connected or tied my subject today around the wisdom of AI. Because wisdom, as a human being, in a matter of seconds, um, what's the smallest unit a second that you can get within a second? In that kind of unit, and you would know, in that kind of unit, my brain can compute, everyone's brain here can compute a number of varying emotions. I can go from sad to angry to happy <laughs> to whatever, particularly I know it's a woman thing, but uh, men will identify this as well. That we can do that, and if machines have to learn that, how are they understanding this sense of what makes us fundamentally human? Now, the case of Twitter this morning on CNN, massive headlines saying, um, that the hate speech has increased fundamentally, a research has found, since Elon Musk has taken over. Unfortunate, but true. He is a free speech absolutionist, as he calls himself. Uh, free speech is, of course, a different subject. But again, it ties to language. Speech, language, written, spoken, expression, multiple languages. A Japanese gentleman was sitting next to me on the flight here from Durban to Dubai. And he explained to me the structure of the Japanese language, which I found very interesting. I didn't know this before. As I head to wrap up my talk, the Japanese language has three parts, haragana, katakana, and kanji. And kanji, I think, is the uh, more difficult of the three sets. It's a script that's based off the Chinese script because it's picture-based. But haragana and katakana are more sound-based, sound-based syllables. And they form a very interesting part of how the la Japanese language is then put together. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this just to give you just very quick snippets or insights into the ability for us to communicate, which is the core fundamental of being a human being. That ability for us then to see ourselves as we see someone else. Spoken and unspoken communication that can transition into kindness. That is then captured in the very manifestation of what is happening around us. And the biggest manifestation of humanity today is technology. If we want to make a change in the world, which we all do, I'm not talking now, I'm not giving a, a Miss World kind of speech here at the end or answering a Miss World question. I want world peace. I do want world peace, by the way. But I think fundamental for us to keep interrogating what care means to us at a fundamental level, at a human level. Because if I walk out of this room and I allow someone to walk out of the door before I do, that says something about my level of care. If I allow uh, an old, older woman, older man to sit, take the, my seat on the bus, that in indicates a level of care. Now, if we're transitioning that into the systems that serve us as human beings while we increase our own wisdom, 
how do we allow kindness to transition or manifest into that? And I will end on this point to say, as I know that I'm at the end of my time now, I will end on this point to say that, you know, Oprah always runs her Super Soul Sundays and she says, what do I know for sure? And then she says, I know for sure. Mm. So I know for sure that in this fast changing world and at the pace that we have, that is unbelievable, incredible, the pace of change that's driven by a technological capacity that we can't even imagine in the years to come. What I do know for sure is that, and as Maya Angelou said, which I think is attributed to her, they may never forget what you said, they may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And how you make someone feel friends is why kindness in AI is so important because it is ultimately the biggest manifestation of who we are as a humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. Um, hey, give me my water. What do you think you're doing? So, so Christopher you Phillips is founder of Socrates Cafe and author, <clears throat> founder the global Socrates Cafe movement, dedicated to make our world uh, more understanding, connected, and participatory through rigorous yet accessible philosophi philosophical inquiry. And in addition to many scholarly says, Dr. Phillips has authored multiple general interesting books translated into many languages, include Arabic, include the claim international bestsellers, Socrates Cafe, A Fresh T Taste of Philosophy, Six Questions of Socrates, as well as Socrates in Love, A Child at Her, His Popular. A series of philosophical children's uh, books include Philosophers Club and Day of Why. Thank you. Uh, your theme is The Space of Time. Is correct? Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I, I have to say before I get started on anything, the, uh, I have to give great thanks to my wife and partner and everything. I get all the credit but she developed uh, this beautiful slide presentation for me, my wife, Cecilia Chapa Phillips. And we met, how many of you have heard of Socrates Cafe? Has anybody, or am I just a legend in my own mind? Yeah, okay, one. Oh, so that's pretty good, two. I'll take two. And so I began in 1996 this project called Socrates Cafe, which is supposed to create a kind of space where we kind of efface or eliminate the barriers between past and present and future, kind of a, almost a tenseless space, even though, of course, it has a beginning and it has an end, but where we are so immersed in an inquiry, so immersed in listening to one another and engaging with one another, that we, we forget about normal concepts, uh, barriers of time and space for just a little while. Before I can really talk about the challenges of technology and the things that we have to overcome, I think I need to share with you just a little bit about what my own, how my own notions of space and time and humanity itself were influenced. Now, during the pandemic, we began holding Socrates cafes, which are explorations using a version of the Socratic method, which I came to call the Socrates cafe method, just to distinguish it from other viable versions of the Socratic method, as a, as a way to just explore timely and timeless questions without feeling like we had to arrive at a final destination. During the, the pandemic, the, we began holding, for the first time, dialogues on platforms like Zoom, which was fascinating because we have about 500 Socrates Cafe groups now around the globe. If you, if you go to our nonprofit website at SocratesCafe.com, you can get information about that. And so it was fabulous. It, if it hadn't been for the pandemic, I would never have even thought of this sort of serendipitous stumbling of holding dialogues on Zoom, even though it seems like a common sense notion. To me, it wasn't. It was all about getting together face to face. 
But even the notion of getting together face to face uh, was something that I did try from the very first years I began Socrates Cafe in 1996 to replicate on other platforms, whatever was available at the time. And that was, that was almost 27 years ago. Things, things like Zoom uh, didn't exist at the time, much less group gatherings. Mm -hmm. So we've been holding dialogues that really F is space and time on, on platforms like Zoom. We have had people in this particular panel, we have one whole classroom from Fort Worth, Texas taking part. We have people from Sarajevo, from Greece, from Turkey, from Saudi Arabia, where there are about 10 ongoing Socrates Cafe groups now. And so I felt like during the pandemic, I had discovered a way to overcome the challenge of isolation and siloing by harnessing technology to gather together on Zoom. But here's the problem, and this is one of the things that I hope that we accomplish when we engage in dialogue. There are tens and tens and tens of millions of people who don't have access to technology that could get them on Zoom. There are many other millions who may have some technology, but it's not fast enough, it's not high speed enough for them to take part on something like Zoom. It, would, it, it will and it has frozen up as we see in many parts of Mexico. Mm -hmm. My wife Cecilia had been a teacher in an indigenous community in Chiapas, Mexico before we met and married. So my thing with Socrates Cafe is it's meant to be a place and space for everybody. But how do we do that when so many people don't have access to, even today, to these vital forms of technology? My hope is that it's not going to keep me from using Zoom. In fact, it might motivate me to use it more than ever. Mm -hmm. But that hopefully we also helps us cultivate the kind of social conscience where we want to make sure that more and more and more and more people can take part. Because if, if not, it becomes just sort of an exercise for me in, in pretentiousness, in snootiness, because I have access to this. I can pay the monthly Zoom fee so I can do it. But what if, if, if so many people are left out, then it leaves wanting what I want for this world. Mm -hmm. The only way I can discover that is actually to hold them on Zoom and then come to the notion that, and the discovery that there's so many people who can't access mm -hmm. these things. And so the world I want is a world in which we all make sure the haves that can do things like Zoom make, want to do their part to contribute so that everyone else can also access this type of technology. It's been so wonderful to have a platform like Zoom where we can see each other. To me, you have to engage face to face. You have to see people's facial gestures and expressions, the gestures that they make in addition to hearing the inflection in their voices. I did not know that at first. When I first started Socrates Cafe face-to-face, -face, I also tried to replicate it on list discussions. I tried to replicate it in something, a virtual platform called Second Life, where people sort of take on avatars. You know about it, John? But here's what, here's what the problem is. There's these groups of people called griefers, they hide behind these platforms and they intentionally want to derail the discussion. They, they come in and they just bombard you with stuff. They constantly are putting you on the defensive or just saying outrageous things just to get you off track, just to get you off the discussion. And, and it, it drives me mad. Why do people want to do that? The same thing happens with Zoom. I wanted to have global Socrates cafes that are totally open to the public. So I would put on Twitter what the Zoom access code was. And lo and behold, people would come and bombard the site with pornography. And I was aghast because there were young people taking part. And once they all come on, there's these groups. Once they start bombarding it, it's, you have to just turn it off. So there's this entire, what I would call almost a separate species that gets their jollies off of making sure that you can't use a platform like Zoom for the reasons that you want. That you can't use it because you can't, 
you have to have this element of trust in order to have a kind of human encounter on a platform where we see each other. But if it's really going to be open to the public, then you need to give public access to it. But if there's members of the public who are going to use it with a specific purpose of derailing your discourse, then it's all for naught. So very reluctantly, I had to keep the passcode secret and that people have to go through various steps before they can sign on. Uh, list discussions also presented a, a, another host of problems. And once again, I wanted to include people who may not be able to read or write, but still have brilliant thoughts. A huge part of our outreach is with indigenous groups around the world. We do have a series of philosophical books that uh, are being published in more and more indigenous languages. Since our focus is in the Latino world, right now they're in several Mayan languages, including Maya, Tzeltal, where my wife was a teacher, and Tzotzil. But over time, it's very important that people can communicate in their own language. The best thing about the pandemic for me was being able to bring children who felt so isolated together on a, on a platform like Zoom to engage in timely and timeless questions. Uh, I wouldn't even dare now to invite other people outside of these specific communities to be part of it because of my horrendous experiences with people who want to come on just to traumatize others. So it just, it just can't work. So you have to accept the strengths of these things where you can at least see each other and you can connect with people all over the globe, but there actually does sadly have to be a little bit of vetting involved. I still have created now a number of hoops that people have to go through in order to engage in a Socrates Cafe dialogue with us on a platform like Zoom. But even then, even though they, even then, even though they're sort of vetted to a certain degree, they, there are still those who come on board just with the purpose of derailing the discourse. But if it's just one at a time, you can quickly zap them and, and eliminate them from these things. One of the reasons I like engaging in dialogues with children is, and this is my, my I have a series, two series of philosophical children's books. This one, Worlds of Difference, has now been designed and translated into Arabic. And anybody who's interested in, it's, it's a book that explores differences. What's the difference between right and wrong, between something and nothing, between good and bad, between a winner and loser? Uh, but one of the reasons I, I personally like to engage with children is because they don't think of time and space in the same way we do. Things are squishier in a beautiful way, almost what I would call a sublime way. So... Again, they're, they're much more tenseless than we're... The, is that for me, that applause? Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, it's really important for me, and we're going to have another Socrates Cafe in that more common public space starting at 5 o'clock till 6.30. It, it would be wonderful and wondrous if children and, and adolescents would come as well. That actually was one of my hopes during this discourse. And there is a children's room upstairs where I just went to uh, thrust myself upon kids to engage in dialogue before I came. But they, they just, they already, this notion of multiverses that uh, very sophisticated scientists are coming up with now, well, kids have been thinking in terms of multiverses forever. And, and, the, the, and the lament is that this kind of thinking and questioning, just as their remarkable invention of new words, tends to get uh, shunted off as they get older. A teacher, how many of you have ever come up with a word and a teacher will tell you, oh no, that's not a word? Yeah? Right? Anybody else? What was the word you came up with? Many words that they wanted just to be equivalent, identical to what comes yeah. in the textbook, regardless of what you say. Thank you for that. Um, but so, for instance, this is a dialogue that I held in Hiroshima, where the, the, the kind of chilling backdrop is the one building that was left intact after the dropping of the atomic bomb. And I, uh, the, you would, the Japanese have a very unique notion of, of what an individual is. And 
and this came through loud and clear in my discussion with, with these young people, uh, they have a notion of what's called ninjin, where people aren't at atomistic by the ninjin concept, but they're all made up of the countless re relations and connections they forge and foster as they are in the process of interacting with the universe itself. So a ninja values the intervals of space, the in-betweens, like the space between beginnings and endings, between life and death. Uh, it's the pauses and the silences, the pause in speech that conveys so much meaning, or the silence between the notes that make music. Uh, that space between musical notes, those silences, are what give form to the whole of what's being said or composed or performed. I like to think of a, so a Socrates cafe too, in terms of musicality, in terms of attunement, in terms of, of a dance, where we're constantly engaging and, and zooming in and zooming out of things. This was held before the days of high technology, this particular dialogue that I had. And we were looking at this question of ikigai, which means that which makes life worth living. And at first we started off uh, with a group of adults in, in the corner. that we're the, We had all just come out of the Peace Museum in Hiroshima, Japan, and we were looking at the, this notion of what is your ikigai, what makes life worth living. And so the children had come from another province, and they, when, when, and they saw my dog-eared sign that says, Welcome to Socrates Cafe, and they asked me what we were talking about, and, and, we, and I told them that we were examining what makes life worth living. And they said, well, you know, it's hard to think in those terms after what we saw in the museum with the horrific photos of the black rain and the absolute decimation of, of an entire city. And, so, and, I, and they said, well, in order to have Ikigai, we need to do something here and now to make sure that that never happens again. And they said the reason that they had been strolling rather aimlessly after they came out of the museum was because they were asking themselves, kids, brainstorming about what could they do to make sure that this never happens again. And the, and the light bulb for them was they were going to develop a, a chain letter. And they were going to send it and, and get... Th their goal was to get tens of millions of people to sign on. So that, because these were the days before technology like mm -hmm. Zoom or anything like that. It wasn't even... A, or even Skype or something like that. And, and so they began forming this chain letter that I took part in. And, and we just began sharing with one another an act of kindness, of deliberate kindness that we did each and every day. Not to show off, mm -hmm. but just because that was our goal, to commit to an act of kindness, intentional or random was beside the point. But we did it all by communicating with each other through email. And by the time, I mean, there must have been thousands of emails that we would send to each other all the time. And it was the most beautiful thing because we harnessed a rather archaic technology as we look at it now. But it allowed us to connect and connect more with people of other societies and cultures, even to learn about their own cultural notion of what, some, of what kindness can amount to. Because if you practice the notion of Ubuntu, which has no real literal translation, I think, because I've held dialogues and in South Africa, where it's sort of I am in you and you are in me, and there's no I without there first being a we, which is very similar to, to early Greek concepts. This idea, you know, this notion that humans, and it goes even further than that, though, um, that for Greeks, there was this, never this notion that humans were at the top of the heap when it came to sentient beings, but that math, rather we were pretty darn insignificant. But nonetheless, we can spend our mortal moment trying to do fairly significant things, but that we never put ourselves front and center of the universe as, as, uh, as sort of atomistic notions of, of what it can mean in the West to be a human being. So I much more, because of my journey, subscribe to notions like Ubuntu, the Japanese notion of Nenjin, which, uh, which to me resonate much more but as a result of holding these dialogues. But it was Hannah Arendt, more than any other philosopher, who influenced my way of thinking. 
So even if I fail madly, and I often do, I often fall flat on my face as I experiment with new ways of engaging people in dialogue, and I'm very open to harnessing new forms, and I'm very sad that I can't make these dialogues online fully public because there's just people who, for whatever reason, get great levels of satisfaction from derailing these heartfelt attempts to connect people. Uh, I, I think it's pathetic. And I th but what can you do? But you have to accept that this is one of the, the possible drawbacks. It's not going to make me quit using it, but I have to be now much more careful than, and cautious than I would ever care to be. Because if you get together in a physical space, if you have a difficult person, if you have somebody who comes deliberately to derail a gathering, it's much, much, much easier for the rest of those here who feel invested in this kind of discourse to make sure that they don't dominate, to make sure that they don't derail than it is on any virtual platform that I, with which I'm yet familiar. I mean, I'm delighted that there's things like Meetup right now. And if you go to, I think it's socratescafe.meetup.com, there's, there's tens of thousands of Socrates participants through Meetups all over the world. But to me, I'm sort of a doing I think all of these things to me are more instrumental means to somehow getting people to want to gather face to face. That to me is what it's all about. Now, this is the island from which my family is from in the South Aegean. It's called Nisoros. And so my goal is to get everybody to live more and more in what I call sea time. The ebb and flow, the incoming tides, and then they go out. Uh, and, I, and I suspect that someday, and I think kids are already on to this notion, we'll see that time is both progressive and regressive, just like the tides themselves. I think this will someday be verified uh, by scientific measuring instruments. But my goal is to, even as we harness more digital technology for activities like Socrates Cafe, to, to accomplish that Arentian goal of engaging in inner and outer dialogue at the same time. My favorite Socrates Cafe dialogues are also ones in which I'm intensely and intensively engaged with myself at the same time, in which there's this sort of introspection as I listen carefully and with all my being to others. But so any kind of technology that I try to harness, any the notion of Habermas's public sphere where we're private people gathering in public places is all about somehow engaging in a kind of interior discourse with myself that helps me achieve what I have on my tattoo, these Greek notions, this really Greek notion of arete, that of becoming a more excellent all-rounder where I'm constantly chipping away at epistemological divides between people. So, but I've, I've been on a 27-year-long journey now of taking any form of technology that exists and trying to channel it into Socrates' cafe topic activities that can connect us in a world in which more and more people seem to be uh, intent on, on derailing them. But so, the, the journey continues. This is a picture of my mentor, Matthew Lipman, who is the founder of philosophy for children program. And the reason that he was able to find this thing is because he respected children and knew that they think in terms of time and space that are so foreign and alien to children that he wanted opportunities early and often to engage with them. But for me, technology is just an instrumental sort of doing means to engage further with people, but never to allow any platform to be a monopoly and ultimately to somehow get us back together to engage with one another face to face. That's the Socrates Cafe way. I, I hope some of you will take part in the one after this session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, we want to Professor Esmaín Jela, a doctor of science in international relations, uh, from the Department of International Studies, University of Algiers, Algiers III. He was formerly an assistant professor at the University of Hasiba Ben Boale, chief where he taught geopolitics, analysis of world politics, and theory of international relations. Uh, 
um, your theme is, your theme is understanding techniques and existence in a post-human condition. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So, in my subject, I will talk about uh, the relationships between techniques and human existence. But in respect in my field of international relations and geopolitics. So, I titled my subject as Robots, Armies, and Geotechnics. Understanding technical and existence in a post-human condition. Uh, my presentation will be in Arabic, but uh, I quickly uh, wrote, yes, uh, morning, uh, a small abstract, a short abstract. I will read this abstract, but we will discuss my presentation in Arabic. I do it under the pressure of time. So, the purpose of this study is to investigate relationship between knowledge and advanced technical discoveries with the experience of human existing existence basing on the philosophy of sociology. Mindwell, it discusses the relationship between human being or beings and things, especially his interaction with smart machines, high technologies and scientific knowledge in a way that these things will be understood within a social relation, relational systems and they will be defined as cultural entities not as a purely technical object. So, the main question here is, how do we explain the, exist the existential interaction of human actor with things and technologies in a post-human and post-industrial era? To answer this question, I s the study takes as an explanatory example the interaction of soldiers with the smart, militia, smart military technologies and machines through the theory of actor rezo network, uh, actor network theory, developed by eminent sociologist, sociologist Bruno Latour in the field of sociology of knowledge and technology in, aim, in our aim to understand the sociology of human and non-human actors. أه سأقدم مداخلة باللغة العربية أه بداية هي تتساءل عن علاقة الإنسان بالتقنية وكيف نفهم هذه العلاقة من حيث التأثير على وجوده البشري هذا من جهة وكمثال لعلاقة الإنسان بالتقنية حاولت أن أختار كنموذج هو العسكري المعزز أو ما يسمى بالفرنسية للصولديار أوغمونتي أه معزز بالتقنية وكذلك حاولت أن أخذ الروبوت العسكري وبصفتي درست مادة الجيوبوليتيك لمدة سبع سنوات في الجامعة الجزائرية الآن أشهد التحولات من الجيوبوليتيك القائمة على الأرض والماء والبحر والجو وما إلى ذلك إلى ميادين جديدة للتنافس الدولي وللتنافس البشري وكذلك ل إن صح التعبير للعوالم الجديدة التي يمكن أن يوجد فيها هذا الإنسان والتي هي عوامل ما بعد بشرية وبالتالي آه هذه العوالم ما بعد بشرية نحن مضطرون للدخول إليها أو نحن من نصنعها ونتعامل معها أو نخلقها ونتعامل معها في ذات الصدد حاولت أن أخذ لفهم هذا الموضوع علاقة العسكري بوصفه ينتج عالما اجتماعيا مع الاشياء لم اجد تقريبا بحث عن كذا منظرين الا ما ساعدني في تبرير هذا هذا التوجه سوى نظريات برينو لاتور الذي هو عالم اجتماع فرنسي مشهور وللاسف لم ياخذ ولد في 1947 توفي اكتوبر الماضي 2022 ترك مجموعه من الكتب في ميدان فلسفه الفعل الاجتماعي في ميدان إبستيمولوجيا العلوم أعاد بالكامل دراسة إبستيمولوجيا العلوم وخرج عن المدارس الكلاسيكية الموروثة منذ عصر دوركايم ومنذ عصر الوضعية ومنذ عصر الكانطية وما إلى ذلك وبالتالي أهمية لاتور الذي تحول فيما بعد إلى مدافع عن عن البيئة حتى كتابه الأخير كان عن البيئة وللأسف برينو لاتور 
هو درس في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية حوالي 47 كتاب كلها باللغة الإنجليزية وحتى كتابه الأساسي كتب بالإنجليزية وترجم إلى الفرنسية رغم أنه فرنسي هو غير معروف بالشكل المطلوب في فرنسا ولكن في العالم العربي مجهول تماما فيه ورقة لباحثة تونسية عملت قراءة كتاب أنا حاليا أشتغل على على تقديمه في في ميدان ابستيمولوجيا العلوم أو علم اجتماع العلوم في العالم العربي وهذا هو كتابه الأساسي رفر شونجي دلا سوسيتي بمعنى إعادة تشكيل الاجتماعي مفهوم الاجتماعي يأخذ فلسفة أو منحى جيد أو منحى كبير في فلسفة برينو لاتور هذا مفهوم الاجتماع هو الذي سأستند عليه في فهم الروبوت العسكري وعلاقته مع الجندي كبشري هذا العالم الاجتماعي هو الذي سأتحدث عنه الكتاب أنا الآن أبحث عن دار نشر لترجمته ممكن إذا حالفنا إذا كانت فيه فرصة محور فكر لاتور هو إعادة التفكير في الاجتماعي Re-understanding the social or the social world برينو لاتور ينطلق من فكرة أساسية أننا لسنا وحدنا كبشر من نشكل العالم وبالتالي عنده كتاب يسمى لم نكن حداثيين أبدا We will never have been modern وبالتالي يقول أن العالم يتكون من الأشياء ويجب أن ننظر إلى الأشياء ليس باعتبارها أغراض صامتة وإنما باعتبارها أغراض تدخل كفاعل ولكن في نظرية الفاعل هو يفرق بين الفاعل الاجتماعي الذي هو الإنسان أو البشري وبين الأغراض كفاعل الأغراض قبل أن تنطلق إلى ميدان الفعل تكون أكتنت بمعنى عناصر قابلة للتفاعل وبعد تدخل البشر تصبح أكترز تصبح فواعل وبعدها طور نظرية تسمى نظرية الفاعل الشبكة أو الفاعل داخل الشبكة وبرينو لاتور على عكس كل تاريخ السوسيولوجيا أو علم الاجتماع لم يبحث في التفرقة بين العالم المادي والعالم الميتافيزيقي وإنما بحث في المجتمع وتركيبة المجتمع والعلاقات الاجتماعية بوصفها اتحادات association لذلك نقول نظرية لاتور هي نظرية الاتحادات بمعنى لما أنا أقوم برفع مثلا هاتف نقال سأفهم الفعل الاجتماعي من خلال الأداة الهاتف الذي يدخل كفاعل وكذلك من خلال الكلام وكذلك من خلال الحركة وكذلك من خلال الوقت ومن خلال الفضاء وبالتالي فهم الفعل الاجتماعي داخل الزمان والمكان وكذلك داخل السياق نظرية الفاعل الشبكة كذلك تطرح لنا أن الأغراض أو الأشياء يمكن بناؤها اجتماعيا بمعنى أن الأشياء وهنا يتحدث بشكل أساسي عن التقنية اللي تهم نحن في مؤتمر الفلسفة حول التقنية والاستكشاف وعلاقتها بوجودنا يفهمها كأنها جزء من الحياة الاجتماعية وبالتالي لم نعد نفرق بين ذلك العالم المادي حتى أنه يرد على التجريبيين علماء البيولوجيا علماء الطب علماء العلوم الدقيقة يقول أنه لا توجد بالمطلق بيانات كمية تجريبية محايدة وإنما من خلال هو عمل كتاب على يسموه كتاب مؤسس في السبعينيات حياة المخبر The Laboratory Life يقول أن الحقائق العلمية هي بناءات اجتماعية ما نجده الآن كحقائق مثلا في التكنولوجيا في الفيزياء في الرياضيات هي بناءات اجتماعية تخضع لتجربة العالم بوصفه إنسان وهو يتدخل في صناعة تلك الحقائق العلمية بمعنى يقول للتجريبيين أن منتجاتكم التي تقول أنها محايدة وأنتجت داخل المخبر وهي معزولة لا هي في حقيقتها تخضع للسياق وتخضع لتدخل الفاعل البشري في هذا الصدد سنحاول أن نفهم 
ماذا يقدم لنا لاتور ضمن ميدان علم الاجتماع العسكري هذا عبارة عن جندي نتيجة تدخل التكنولوجيا قدرات الإنسان أصبحت محدودة وبالتالي نحاول تطوير قدرات الإنسان من خلال دمج التكنولوجيا في جسده فهذه الخودة مثلا تسمى الخودة التخاطرية الخودة التخاطرية هي عبارة عن خودة مصممة لتبادل الإدراك معناه سنكون في حالة الحرب وسنكون داخل ميدان المعركة وبالتالي سيفهم الجندي المقابل لي أو الجندي في مكان آخر ماذا أفكر أن أقوم بالفعل المستقبلي وعملية التخاطر هي عملية تمجد ما بين علم النفس الاجتماعي وما بين كذلك التقني إضافة إلى ذلك وهذا الرجل أو الجندي يسمى الجندي المعزز المعزز تقنيا وإضافة إلى الخود البشرية هناك كذلك شرائح أصبحت تغرس في اليد هناك شرائح أصبحت تغرس في في الأذن وبدأت السيالات تأخذ أو تقرأ عن طريق سيالات عصبية يتم بعثها إلى سنسورز إلى أجهزة تحسسية ويتم بعثها إلى القيادة وبعد ذلك تكون العملية التفاعلية ما بين الجندي وما بين القيادة واختاريت أنا هذا المجال أو هذا المثال لسببين السبب الأول احتراما لتخصصي والسبب الثاني لأني أؤمن بأن كل الاكتشاف العلمي أو اكتشافات الفضاء أو المعرفة التقنية المتقدمة جدا هي نشأت في بداية الأمر عن طريق المباحث والمخابر العسكرية نأخذ على سبيل المثال نوربرت فاينر أول من اصطلح مؤسس مؤسس السايبرية أو سايبر هو خد منحة في محد الدراسات العسكرية المتقدمة في الولايات المتحدة وحتى الآن نتحدث عن الريبوت وعن السايبرغ السايبرغ الذي هو عبارة عن دمج العضوي إنسان والآلي والبيولوجي والأوتوماتيكي هذه ربع ميادين تتحد لتشكل لنا الإنسان السايبرغ كلها طورت داخل المخابر العسكرية كذلك لا يمكن أن أتناسى وأصحاب الفلسفة يقدمون لنا دائما علاقة المعرفة بالقوة وبالهيمنة وبالتالي عملية الاستكشاف واستكشاف الفضاء لا تنعزل عن عمليات القوة والهيمنة وأنا كمناصر للعلاقات الدولية وللعلوم السياسية وللدولة لا أنظر بشكل سلبي إلى هذه الأمور بل أقول أنها مطلوبة لذلك عبر التاريخ منذ الحضارات منذ حضارة روما لم يتطور العلم إلا بالدولة واللي نعتبرها أنا شخصيا أعظم اختراع بشري صنعه الإنسان وبالتالي تطورت كل هذه البحوث السايبرية بنتيجة نتيجة الاهتمام العسكري والآن في علاقات مدنية عسكرية ممكن يستفيدون هذا كذلك العين التي يمكن أن ترى لأن الجلدي لما يحس بالإرهاق تتدخل التكنولوجيا وتعطيه رؤية أخرى هذه كذلك جزء من الخوضة التخاطرية الآن نتحول إلى روبوت عسكري مباشر هذا الروبوت العسكري أولا يتحرك في الميدان نتيجة إما البرمجة الذاتية التي تكون وهنا هذه تسمى بالمركبات الغير مأهولة أنماند سيستمز أو الأنظمة الغير المأهولة واللي تأخذ أربعة أنماط على حسب درجة الاستقلالية أنظمة مستقلة أنظمة شبه مستقلة أنظمة للتحكم عن بعد وكذلك أنظمة للتحكم عن بعد والتحكم اليدوي وبالتالي نأخذ مثلا الروبوت الآن لما نعطي الأمر العسكري هل هذا الروبوت بعد اندماجه مع الإنسان كيف نمكن أن نفهم العملية العسكرية بطريقة أخرى مثلا أنا ضابط عسكري سأخذ مجموعة عشرة جنود بشر وسأقوم بعملية ما هل هي نفسها لما أخذ عشرة جنود روبوتات؟ هل سي... كيف ستكون درجة التفاعل ما بيني وما بين الآلة التي أنا صنعتها مبرمجة لها؟ هل الآلة ستطور إدراك مستقل لها عني؟ وهذا النقاش الآن هل يمكن أن تطور الآلات إدراكها الذاتي؟ هنا أستحضر فيلم لويل سميث 
أتابعه باستمرار أنتظر الجزء الثاني يسمى آي روبوت والفيلم يطرح يطرح نقطة مهمة أنه لما يغرق ولد ويل سميت في البحر عن طريق السيارة يطلب منه البشري أن ينقذ طفله في البحر بغمزة العين ولكن الروبوت لا يفهم غمزة العين وبالتالي سيذهب مباشرة وينقذ الأب الذي كان أمامه ويترك الطفل يغرق وبالتالي الروبوت لن يطور إدراكا نستطيع معه ولكن وفق برينو لاتور هو يفهم هذا الفعل الاجتماعي مثلا عملية عسكرية مثلا أمر يفهم هذا الفعل الاجتماعي من على أنه فعل مؤسس بشريا بمعنى على أنه فعل ينتمي إلى عالم البشر وبالتالي هو تقريبا إذا استحضرنا مقولة هايدغر توسكي ليسونس دلا تكنيك نيبا تكنيك جوهر التقنية ليس بتقني وبالتالي سيقودنا فكر هايدغر أو مقولة هايدغر إلى ما أتبنى أن التقنية ليست محايدة والتقنية ليست موضوعية وبالتالي وراء التقنية هناك تدخل سلطة تدخل قمر تدخل فاعل تدخل إدراك تدخل علاقات أو انتيركشنز أو تفاعلات هذه اللي قلنا حول العملية العسكرية ما بين الروبوت وما بين البشر الآن فيه مشروع في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية يسمى Human Robots Interaction يقيمون درجة التفاعل ما بين الإنسان وما بين ما بين البشر وهناك اختلافات في الفعل الاجتماعي مع الأداة أو مع الشيء أن التجربة لما تتكرر عند فواعل مختلفة فستكون النتائج مختلفة وبالتالي ما نستطيع الختام به ممكن أن أقرأ كلمة رائعة لبرون لاتور يقول كيسكي يبلي دون لاكسيون تكنيك سأترجم لو طون لسباس لو تيب داكتون يقول هو يقدم نظرية لو بلي لو بلي اللي هي عبارة عن الثنية أو الطية فولدينغ فولدينغ الثنية أو الطية يقول أن داخل فعل التقنية داخل فعل التقنية هناك في الداخل الزمان المكان والأكتنت أي العنصر القابل ل أن يكون فاعلا هذا الأكتنت بعد تدخل فعل بشري يصبح فاعل وبالتالي فالأشياء هي فاعلة كما نحن البشر وسأختم هنا نحن في نظرية العلاقة الدولية لما ندرسها نقول الفواعل إما الدولة وإما الفواعل المنظمات الإقليمية وإما الفواعل البشرية وبالتالي ما زلنا في نظرية العلاقة الدولية سجناء النظرية نظرية الوضع البشري ولم نفكر أن العلاقات الدولية تتأسس في وضع ما بعد تقني وما بعد بشري وهذا عليها أن تراجع نفسها الجيوبوليتيك على كل حال أخذت منحة الآن الجيوبوليتيك تحولت إلى الجيوتكنيك وأنا أترجم في هذا الصدد شكرا Thank you very much And the last doctor Gerardo de la Fuente Lora Uh, born in Mexico, Professor de la Fuente, studied philosophy at the Nas National Autonomous University Mexico. of Mexico, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico, institution where he obtained his PhD, which honorific mention. Uh, he's currently a full-time definitive career professor at the College of Latin American Studies of the Faculty of Philosophy and Letters of the INAM. University Autonoma of Mexico. He's a member of the National System of Research of Mexico. He was a researcher at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico and at the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Humanities of the UNAM. He was coordinator of the College of Philosophy of the Faculty of Philosophy and Leaders of the UNAM. He's a member of the Philosophical Association of Mex Mexico and is currently President of the Society for Phenomenology and Media. Um, your theme is, we need to tell, uh, to tell about what reality is, uh -huh. 
It is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandra. Thank you. And thank you to the organizers. To the, thank you for the invitation to participate here in this very, very important conference. Well, thank you. when I was preparing my participation here, I was reading a book by Brian Greene. This is a physicist, this scientific. And in his book about the end of time, he says uh, something that, that I think it's very, very important for what I, I'm trying to say here today. My thesis is very simple. Uh, I think that we need to talk about what reality is. Especially because the new technologies produce an, a peculiar dissociation in our senses. And I think this quote by Brian Greene shows especially clear the, the, the way I'm thinking about it. I quote, says Brian Greene, he says, clips from films in, run in reverse are amusing for the very reason that what what C projected differs so thoroughly from anything we experience. That's a quote. Again, clips from films run in reverse are amusing for the very reason that, we, that what we see projected differs so thoroughly from anything we experience. So when we see a film run in reverse, going back, we, think, we, th we see things very strange. We see a glass that is broken in the floor, but now in the film, he's returning for the original place. But what is very interesting in the quote by Greeny, by this scientist, is that he says a paradox. He says, we are amused by the, the return of the, of the glass because that is something that we never experience, but we are seeing right now the glass come again to the first position. We are experiencing the glass going back to the first position, but the scientist says we never experience that. And that's a paradox. What about, what is the reality of the image we are seeing now of the glass who is returning back to the beginning. I think this effect is produced by all the technologies that construct in the image field. We don't know exactly what is the status of reality of that images, but that images forms part of our experience, but we don't know exactly what part they took. I will, give you, I will give you an example. I think that one of the main reasons, because we are now killing the animals, extinguishing the species, the animal species, is because we, in our televisions, in our, in our and in internet, in networks, we can see every day, at each hour, documentals, films, images of the animals. We never think in the ordinary life that animals is, is a, a, just to, to, to end his, his life. We never think about extinction because we always are seeing the animals. The animals are there, and they are, and they are in our uh, everyday life. They are uh, partners of our life. Tigers, elephants are inhabiting with us in our everyday life. So, I think that if we no, if not discuss about the reality of images, we will continue to extinguishing the animals, because we don't have idea of what is the difference in between images, reality, and the other experience, experience, reality. I think the only possibility to use the images in the media to prevent 
the extinction of the animals would be to to know to know um, produce and diffuse uh, films about the animals. Only if the films about the animals are extinguishing, we will understand that the real animals are close to the end. I think this is an extreme case of this, of this idea I want to tell you. We don't know what the image reality is. Mm -hmm. um, when studying the film, the film industry, the film, the cinema experience, Edgar Morin, this French philosopher, uh, says that what is characteristic, that is special about film, is that the film uh, seduces us. The, the film uh, grapes us, the film makes some kind of magic with us. The film gives us an experience of, of something very magic. Uh, we see the film and we think uh, we are inside the film. That's the enchantment, the film. Uh, Edgar Moran says, this is because film, because filmic image have a, a special characteristic that he names photogenic. This is a characteristic, this is, is a, a characteristic of old if fixed images. When we are in the restaurant, we are chatting, we are taking drinks, we are uh, relaxed. Somebody says, oh, wait, wait, let's take a photo. And in that moment, we are, are uh, fixed. We are in a, in a special mood uh, because the photo produce us uh, some kind of discomfort. Moran says, why the photo produce this discomfort on us? E Moran says, that's why, that, that's because the image is a premonition of our death. In a first sense, the image is a premonition of our transcendence. All we will, will die but the image will, will be permanent there. After generation, we will be there in our photo. That's the reason why we need to be good in the photo. We need to be uh, makeup, we need to be fine. So when that somebody says photo, we, we, because we are thinking about in eternity, the photo will, will survive us. But in another sense, the photographic image is a premonition of our death because the photo, the fixed photo, takes us without movement. The photo takes our instant and it freezes our instant. But the difference between us and our dead body is that we are moving. We will know when you are that be dead because you are not moving. You are moving, so you are alive. So the photo takes our dead body. That's why photo produce us so kind of discomfort. We cannot take a photo of the live people. Always we take a photo, we take the photo, an image of the dead people. That's why the photo is, is not a trivial thing. When a, when a photo appears, so we are in danger of death, or we are reminded that we are death, possible death. In this characteristic, this photogenic, this premonition of transcendence, of, or this premonition of death, is what makes photo so dangerous and so special in our life, in our society. And this characteristic is special, uh, sharp, in, in the cinema experience. Because in cinema experience, we see the dead living. I, I see the, the old films, the Mexican old films. Uh, did you hear sometime about Cantinflas? Take by example. 
the old characters, the old people who lived uh, decades ago, are now living in their images. The film shows that living death. What are appearing in the film are the living deads. And they are moving, but they are deads. This is the strange magic of film. And we can relate this with the, especially with the films, we can take this in account when we analyze, especially the films about robots and the rebellion of, of robots. When we see the tradition of uh, literature and cinema about the rebellion of robots, we can go from Frankenstein, there, there's a first age of the rebellion of, of robots. The first age is from Frankenstein to Robocop, <laughs> passing especially over Blade Runner. In this first age of rebellion of robots, what happens is that uh, the robot, the individual robot, becomes more and more and more humans until the moment that they are more humans than humans. And so, in that moment, we need to kill the robot. We need to destroy the robot because the robot is more human than we. That's a problem with Frankenstein. Frankenstein develops passions that are more important, more accurate than the passions of the humans, and so we need to destroy them. This is especially the theme, the theme in Blade Runner. At the end of the film is the robot who saves the human. The robot is most human that humans, and we cannot permit that. We need to destroy the robots because the robots are more human than we. That's the first age of robot rebellion in literature and in cinema. But there is another age, the second age, goes from Terminator to Matrix. In this second age, the robot rebellion is not a rebellion, it's, it's not a revolt by one individual robot, but it's the rebellion of a system mm. of robots. Mm. The, the computer, the computer system that Matrix represents, don't destroy us because Matrix wants to be human. Don't destroy us because Matrix is... Uh, is competing with us for the land in the sense of the a new humanity. Nothing to do with that. In the second age of cinema revolution of machines, in this second age, machines revolt for nothing. Mm. There is no reason about the rebellion of machines. Yes. Terminator comes here to destruct us without reason. And Matrix appears over us without considering, considering to us our life. They are not competing. They are only extensive. We, in, the, in these pictures of the second age, we all try, we as humans, uh, try to control, try to humanize this situation. All we are fighting to make sense of this rebellion of the machines. And one point, that's especially an important point of this, is that in this second age of robot rebellions in cinema, is that the time is circular. It's a cycle. The machines will rebel, will, will revolt, but the machines has revol revolted uh, first, we are now in the revolt of the machines, but the revolt of the machines will be in the future. The future is the past. We are always in the same, in the same circle. Okay? Yes. Always, the, the theme of the revolt of machines, the revolt of, of robots, it's a question, it's a topic about government and control. In the 
classic mm -hmm. political philosophy, we construct the society as a machine. If we, if we read Hobbes, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Rousseau, all the classical political think, um, always the case is to construct the society as a machine because if the society is a mechanism, we can control and we can govern the mechanism. When we think, we think about the robust rebellion, we are thinking a political question. The problem is, what about if mm. we cannot control the robots we are constructed? In the two ages of robot rebellion, the problem is a political problem. What we are thinking about is, what if we cannot control our productions as humans, as societies? What if all our systems, our transhuman system, as, says, as uh, he uh, just says, what if that systems are out of control, are, have no sense in human terms? So we need to try again and again and again to control. We hope that the next, uh, the next turn of the cycle, maybe we will can, we will we be capable to control the structure of this system. That's why in this second uh, era, this second age of robot rebellion, the time is circular. Okay, but returning to our first first point, I said. Images produce in us a peculiar dissociation of our senses because we are seeing the glass returning to their first position, but in some sense we say that it's not real. We are not experiencing that, but we are experiencing that. This is that is the, the peculiar th uh, question in cinema, too, because we are seeing the living dead, and we know that we cannot survive the death. We are humans, because we are going to death, as says Heidegger, Sartre, and all the philosophy. What characterizes the human is we are finite. It's the finitude. <clears throat> we are going to die, to die, but when we see the cinema, we have a kind of peculiar experience. We experience the police possibility of survival. They are, they, the characters in the, in the image are survivals. Maybe we can survive. Maybe if we, each one of us, transform in an image, we will survive. So we need to take videos of all the things we are living as this conference, because this conference will survive in the future, and we will be, I will be there saying that we will survive all we together, we will survive in the future. But all this produces in us a kind of <coughs> madness. We are very insane in all this. The robots, films, the robot literature, always have this component of death and life. Frankenstein, it's a dead body who becomes alive. Always the robot, the robot idea is the idea that we can overcome death. Robocop is a dead body that is new in la alive because we put parts on them. We okay. can discuss that. Sorry. We can analyze. Okay. You, you can we can analyze other films, each film, and you will see that in all cases the robots have to do with the survive to the death. So to end this. How can we live with this? How can we distinguish what is this kind of experience in image and what is this supposedly our experience? Because see films, 
is part of our experience. When we see the Spider-Man, the Spider-Man exists as you exist. How can we uh, know what is real? To finish, I remember this film about Nash, John Nash, who was Nobel Prize of Economics, mathematician, Nobel Prize of Economy, that was insane. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the, of the film, Nash invites his friends to tell him in each moment if what he is seeing in this moment is real or is mm -hmm. not real. It was the only way to control his madness. So I think we, we need to, to, to take that same path. Now, we need to ask Alejandra, ask Giacomo, ask the people who are around us, tell me, is this real or is this not real? Because we need the, the help of us. We, help, we need the help of our community to, uh, to be sure that we are living in a real world and we can say, as Brian Greene, Brian Greene, the physicist, I quote, this, not, this is not part of my experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just time. Uh, any, any question? Yes. Lo que te pregunto es, ¿tienes una pluma? ¿Tienes una pluma? A pen? One right. only question. Yes, sir. Sir. He need the pen. You have a pen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's, it's 20 pesos. <laughs> 20 pesos. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, presentation for all the panelists. Thank you. And actually, I have uh, some questions for Dr. Jilla about his presentation for the post-humanity. Yes. Uh, I see a lot of slides that you already presented about the military. And you conclude that we will uh, shift from geopolitics to geotechnology. So this is your conclusion. And nowadays, the technology is evolving in the cyberspace. And it's led by, as you mentioned, by the defense activities. And, the, and it's already created by the defense labs. But now the limits between the virtual world and the real world. No way the robots can have consciousness. Consciousness is a big issue. And if we can understand the human consciousness so we can understand the universe and ourselves. So consciousness still is a big issue. I refer back to David Chalmers, who is the professor in New York University, and he one of the world leaders in research of consciousness. And his latest book last year, 2021, Virtual Plus or Reality Plus, and still he says, this is a very, very delicate and sensitive issue that will differentiate between the virtual world and the real world. So post-humanity, as you mentioned, still there is no consciousness. Can you elaborate on that? Thank you. Can you elaborate or answer yes, this, my yes, clarification? Yes, yes. Thank you. First, I'm so pleased, uh, Professor, mm -hmm. that you are assist this uh, workshop. So, I take the, your same position in my article. So, I talk that we can't have uh, an independent consciousness for robots. But, uh, and I say, I spoke to an expert, a technical expert, and I believe that man can control 
this all our techniques. Uh, if we look to the ancient civilization, every discover, every uh, some modern techniques uh, make a fear in society. It's uh, something it's unknown uh, and that we cannot understand. Now, the, I spoke about techniques and post-human as uh, a word compound between two things, between human and, uh, and non-human uh, actors. So, I take your same position that the consciousness is something, uh, something um, perfect uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, describe uh, man's, uh, that describes our world, that uh, uh, the creator make it to, to his kainat uh, al uh, so, uh, I have, uh, I just want to, to develop this subject of uh, geotechnics to understand the interaction. My, 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 whole, my main purpose here is how to understand the interaction between soldiers and techniques. Should we, uh, should we explain this word, this social word, as a social actors as a social human actors, or should we integrate it, the uh, the machines and the object as an actor or an actant in this uh, social action? So the the question here is what type of social action we should explain? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other question? Well, yes, for you. Thanks to everyone. This was a great, great session. Uh, but I have a, a specific question for Nazreen. Uh, your talk was really interesting in trying to bring us to think about AI ethics from a, a different kind of viewpoint mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to focus on care rather than justice, for instance, um, <laughs> as, as the primary concern which doesn't really come up a lot in AI ethics principles. Uh, they, they tend to be focused on right. justice, right. privacy, right. The, these sorts of right. standard right. ethical uh, ways of thinking about our relationship with machines. Um, so what I'm really interested in is do you have any kind of... Uh, we had a, this really great talk last mm -hmm. night explaining to everyone at the conference what care ethics is and what, what it's motivated by. And um, so it's, it's quite a bit different than what usually motivates AI. So do you have concepts for a system sketch um, of some sort of how, how you would take AI uh, and have it be, uh, construct a, a system in which care for, is foregrounded rather than sidelined? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, John. That's a great question. Um, care as a concept starts in a very personal space. Um, I've noticed, observed from both a professional and personal aspect. It's uh, just understanding, um, if we take a simple example like the wearing of masks during the pandemic, across the world, and I think you, you may have used the example as well um, with robots, being uh, established in different regions and the way people responded to the call by the robot to wear a mask or protect yourself. Um, some people would say, I don't need to wear a mask. Why should I bother about other people? If I have, and I have actually experienced in a personal environment, uh, people saying, I have COVID, but I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm going to go to work. Um, not a re little realizing that we saw um, uh, images now coming from China of two of the COVID workers forcefully removing someone from their home. This person wasn't, didn't even test positive, but uh, was supposed to be a close contact with someone who had COVID. Now, the, the concept of care, again, I'm going to say this, is a very personal and deeply personal one. So human beings have to uh, deeply interrogate their own sense of what it means to um, be selfless in the service of someone else. 
it disregards religion, it disregards your personal value system, mm. or anything like that. Will I allow someone to progress or go ahead of me? The sense of me and self. If we align that then to what it means to build out an AI system and are there guidelines to do that, it really is about human beings coming together and saying, mm. I put aside self-interest in the interest of others. Mm. But whether our uh, uh, regulation as a whole, as a concept, and you talked about the word justice, and justice is around universal principles of what it means to serve uh, someone so that their right is enhanced or that they get their fair due. Fair due also in cultural specifics are very different. There was a case in KwaZulu-Natal where I'm from, in South Africa, in Durban. There's an area called St. Lucia. It's St. Lucia Wetlands. Beautiful place. Uh, biodiversity is very broad. And in that area, now if you know South Africa, we have a range of races, you know, uh, multicultural environment, mm -hmm. yeah. but the black community there really believe that to take turtles, it's this very large turtle population, it's fine to take the turtles and you, you can use them for food or whatever it is. So they'll, they'll catch this animal um, and they'll obviously kill it and be able to do something with it. Mm -hmm. But the gentleman there, he was arrested um, by the authorities and then there was a massive education program that had to be done because of the cultural reference around what it meant to as assign respect to that, human, that animal and what it might be. You get, the, you get the idea. So he's then gone on to a campaign to educate his own community mm -hmm. and in sort of a kind of a trial and retribution manner to now educate the rest of the community but understand what it means from another perspective of justice. But if we come back again to an AI system, and you said this rightly so yesterday in your lecture, guidelines are written as they are in any uh, frame of life, a framework, is to give you a sense of what could potentially be as a collective that we agree. But rules, on the other hand, I think where AI is desperately needing um, the soft, what we call the softer side. Now, boardroom, uh, we have sat in many boardroom discussions for everybody mm -hmm. in this room. Uh, where C-suite executives are saying, well, I'm really worried about the bottom line. I really don't care about empathy at this point. They're not going to say it that bluntly. So it's going to be a sense of, again, let's round up the answer. Uh, how do I fundamentally as a human being understand my level of care? And if I do so distinctly, then it's going to come out in my ability to impact whatever it is, that it, a positive social impact. I know we haven't answered the question, but that's really a, just a thought process, mm -hmm. I suppose. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think we want to have more time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, let's go to the conclusions. For conclusions, some ideas to share with you. <laughs> the common thread of the folks' positions, I think, has been the ways of approaching what we call reality, direct or indirectly. Uh, that is a historical, philosophical task. Uh, way, each one presented different topics, topics, but an open questions, question critical to possibilities oh. and liability, liability claims about what is said and done. Likewise, uh, space has been present under complementary senses and implications of time, conscious, past and future support possibilities of technology as a projection of human existence or post-human existence, maybe. Mm -hmm. Philosophy is not only theory, but also critical practice. Does anyone want to add something? No, thank you very much. Can I have a question to Alejandro? Uh, in short time. Yes. He uh, yes. described the, when we take a photo, we just meet like this because <laughs> we, 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 uh, because the photo fix, uh, fix us in time and space and still from us the movement. This, uh, the, this operation to steal the movement, you called it photo as this. Uh -huh. Yes? As that body, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
I just have another idea, if you can explain or correct to me. I think that when we take photo is a question about beauty. So we make us, we take us yes, the yes. photo that this beauty, this uh, position or situation of beauty can be eternal. In our religion, we say, uh, and we have another verse, a great verse, say, that God created the uh, man or human in the perfect form. <laughs> so, I. Uh, so I think that when we take photo and we share it on Facebook, on Twitter, we just uh, uh, add some effects just to be more beautiful. Yes. We, we buy iPhone 14, just that the photo becomes beautiful. I yes. just have this idea that photo between as a diet and photo as a beauty. Yes, but in the West civilization and Christian Christianity civilization, there's another there's another point in yes. that is that God creates the man as, as in his image and similitude. God in the Bible creates the man as, as his image. So when we take an, an image, we have this kind of blasphemous <laughs> position in front of, of God. The, this is why we Exactly, we need to be beauty because God is beauty, but at the same time, we are performing an heresy because we, we have not the right to make images of us. The only image we, have, we can have is the image of God. He is the only photographer we can permit. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> he said that in our Quran, that God, there is nothing no. uh, similar to his image. Okay, yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's a, it's a very important difference between yes. East and West, this this position of the image this in, the, in all the civilization, because West have um, an image uh, permission. And all the difference between uh, inside the West are differences about the image degree in relation with God. So in the East Christianity, the image is a sacred image, so we, pay, you, we paint icons, icons. Because not all images is, is permitted, permitted. I don't know how it's permitted. Yes? And in the Catholic uh, part, all the images are permitted. But in between, there are all the grades. And each grade is a, a, um, an a special uh, civilization part. And it is, it's a part, it's a, it's a point of, of of fight when East Christianity and West Christianity fight always are because images. Mm. Images is a, a hard point. You are better than we because you, you do not permit images and that's all. I agree with you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, look up. I, I only... Uh, I understood some brief parts. <laughs> we will discuss it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So.